when we are doing the will of our true self, we are inevitably doing the will of the universe. In magic, these are seen as indistinguishable. That every human soul is in fact one human soul. It is the soul of the universe itself. And as long as you are doing the will of the universe, then it is impossible to do anything wrong. Slither hither, weirdos and witches. My name is Keats Ross, and you're listening to Prague Magic. As I camped in the Oregon wilderness preparing to perform a magnanimous magical ritual during the totality of the 2017 solar eclipse, I had been intellectually snacking, forgive the term, on Mitch Horowitz's Occult America. And under that 2017 eclipse, I would go on to perform a ritual that would prove to be my personal metaphysical resurgence, from teetering woo-woo chrysalis to full-blown weirdo, midwifing my current metaphysical trajectory that led to this very podcast. I had chosen to identify as Revel Ross, a pseudonym meant to conjure confidence in sharing my metaphysical musings. It's only fitting then that under this recent total lunar eclipse, under a super wolf blood moon, all but two years later, I retired that pseudonym of Revel Ross. I've accepted to tether all my art and creativity under my name of Keats Ross. Now, unafraid about the professionalism of my woo-woo wiles. And the person that helped solidify this decision was none other than Mitch Horowitz himself, via this following discussion about his most recent book, The Miracle Club, and the importance of transparency within the spiritual arena. I've written extensively about the Miracle Club, which you can read in the show notes below. And it's because of this analysis and Mitch's subsequent retweets of this analysis, I was able to find the gusto to ask Mitch to be the 17th guest on this nascent seeker sought seeking podcast, Pragmagic. Eternal return, synchronous, reaching, probably. But it means a lot that he would devote his time to discussing his definite chief aim of chronicling metaphysical experiences, a life focus that relates to mine and the basis of this very podcast. Also, I get to introduce Mitch to the Japanese term ikigai, which roughly translates to reason for being. So slither hither, weirdos and witches. Here's Mitch Horowitz. I am. Uh, I might be a little too excitable, so I'll try to be as linear as possible. <laughs> no such thing as too excitable in my world. That's all good. <laughs> well, good. Yeah. yeah. This is such an intellectual and I guess metaphysical come up for me because we share a similar definite chief aim. Oh, cool. Yours, as you've said, is to chronicle metaphysical experiences. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mine is similar in that, but to enhance and inspire the creative process as an art. Wonderful. And That's so wonderful. When did that definite chief aim reveal itself to you? It was probably in the year 2013. I had been reading the book Think and Grow Rich casually for years, kind of picking through it. And it dawned on me that year that I was doing this the wrong way that I had to kind of throw out everything that had come before. I had to rid myself of all these notions that because I was supposedly some sort of an experienced reader in the genre of self-development, that there was exercises or other things that I had already done or that I could skip, that I could overlook. And I just made this decision to make a completely fresh reading of the book with so-called beginner's mind. and. I did every exercise. I I read every passage. I covered every step, even if it was something that I was certain that I had done before in some other context or in some other way. 
And that year, the end of that year, is when things really began to change for me. And I came to a crystal sharp perspective, not only on my definite aim, but to be frank, I was no longer afraid to attach things to that aim, including money and writing down sums of money, which were steps that I had previously resisted because I regarded them as somehow contrary to my spiritual principles. And yeah. it gave me a whole new perspective on my search, a whole new perspective. And so I think getting rid of notions that uh, a person is somehow an accomplished seeker can be so helpful in coming to a definite aim and not putting any boundaries on that aim. It challenged everything for me. It was really helpful. So that, in a sense, created this trajectory that you're on now. Exactly. Exactly. And it also challenged my own sense of the search because I think probably up until that time, and I write about this in the Miracle Club, I, like many other seekers, <clears throat> were fixated on these very secondhand ideas of non-attachment or non-identification. And right. I came to question those ideas. I really came to question the workability of those ideas, where they come from, <clears throat> whether and to what extent they suit the needs of the contemporary seeker. It gave me a, it revolutionized my idea of the search, honestly. Yeah. And did your job as publisher at Penguin for New Age books and and whatnot, was that an answer or a symptom of this definite aim or was that uh, helping to create it? I think it was helping to create it. Uh, I was in that job for many, many years and that job was good to me, but I was always dissatisfied. I always felt restless. I was earning a good living. It gave me a lot of stability. It taught me a lot of things. It put me in touch with people who proved hugely influential on my life. But the greatest thing that I got from it was rediscovering myself as a writer. I think in working with those ideas, I started to rediscover my own voice and purpose and direction as a writer, going back to, oh boy, maybe summer, fall of 2003. And I, I got the first inkling at that time that documenting that a physical experience in both history and practice, including my own practice, was at the heart of what I wanted to do. And so the greatest thing that publishing gave me ultimately was the rediscovery of myself as a writer. That's very cool. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the ethos that you exude with being this believing historian, I think is mm. so potent, especially for people that are interested in the metaphysical communities to see a structure to see a viable kind of success story in a way of merging otherwise disparate ideas of material wealth and of success with, you know, uh, seeking. And I really appreciated that as the crux of the Miracle Club. Oh, I appreciate that. Given, you know, it was, uh, we all got to survive. We all got to, you know, create yeah. and secure a world around us. And as much as we'd like to be these non-attachment based vagabonds in a way, it's it's just, it's impossible to do that. Yes. And, yeah, so, I was wondering, oh, go ahead. No, there's so much, you know, I wanted to pick up on two things that you said, and I really appreciate your referencing the believing historian phrase, because that's, that's been true of me since the beginning. And I, you know, the truth is most historians of religious experience are believing historians. They don't make that declaration yeah. because they fear that that declaration or being too explicit about it will compromise them or will marginalize them or will detract from the perception of their seriousness. But I think that's the wrong approach. And I think it also keeps people from exploring some of the most important artistic work and 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 keeps and and perhaps even stymies their search. I was just thinking about this yesterday. I know a man who is well into his 70s at this point who is a uh, I would say highly regarded essayist, critic, writer, historian of religion. And years ago he disclosed to me that he was very very interested in the teachings of a fairly contemporary channeler. And he shared with me this person's teachings, and they were indeed very substantial, very, very substantial. But at the end of our conversation, he said to me very pointedly 
that he wanted me to keep this private. He did not want this side of him known to the world. Yeah. And of course, I respect people's privacy, and it was a private conversation, and I agreed, and I'll always respect his privacy. But I thought to myself at the same time, my God, like, what, you know, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? I mean, we're not all sticking around, you know, yeah. into the medium term future. So um, why not challenge preconceptions? How powerful it would be if somebody with a significant critical mind would stand up and say, you know, this channeled material is of extraordinary consequence and, and gravity. Yeah. And let the naysayers complain, you know, let them complain. It could be the most important step in his career and in his personal search. You know, I mean, it could be the thing that, that suddenly distinguishes him. And yet, because he's, um, fearful of the consequences because he wants to preserve respectability. He keeps this intensively private. And my feeling is, I just don't understand that. You know, I just don't understand that. You know, what if Muhammad said, well, everyone's going to think I'm a nut. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll keep these, you know, keep it to yourself. Quatrains private. Yeah. Or Lao Tzu <laughs> said, you know, I, I don't want to seem like an idiot, so I'm not going to write any of this stuff down. You know, yeah, Alan it just Smithy. doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And so, I think that uh, I think people should be brave about declaring what they believe and defending it. And it, it might open up doors to them that they could have never imagined. That's so synchronous to something that I've decided this week. I, too, was separating my metaphysical musings and whatnot under a pseudonym or a pen name. And it was yeah. a means to kind of keep my professional legal name out of that realm. And yeah. I did a horrible job with it. I can't help but just <laughs> tie everything back together. So I finally sure. just deconstructed that and was like, you know what? Going by Keats Ross, everything is me. Enough of this pen name, enough of this separation, because it's a bit dishonest in a way. Yes. And it takes a toll. It takes an unseen toll. I think the individual will feel a lot more relaxed, yeah. will feel a lot more confident. Creativity flows better. When you lead one whole life and you don't try to slice and dice your identities and it brings surprises, you know, it brings surprises. I mean, people say to me, for example, gee, you must hear from a lot of nuts on the Internet. Uh -huh. Very, very few, very, very few. And I make myself hugely available. My personal email is on my website. Anybody can contact me. All my um, social media posts are completely public. I don't block anybody. Uh, and it, it's amazing the, uh, incredibly, incredibly small amount of hate or trolling that I get. And that, that may have something to do with the fact that I make myself completely available Yeah, and it, it runs contrary to what people think because people think, well, gee, if I put my email up online, you know, I'll get flooded with crap and I really don't. You know, 99% of the emails I get from people are from earnest seekers who really have something to say, who have a sincere question, or who maybe share a piece of news with me that's very interesting. And, you know, we don't test these preconceptions. And likewise, everything I've ever written, including on controversial topics like Satanism, I put my own byline to people know who I am. They know what I'm about. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, I'll get misunderstood. But even the misunderstandings are educative. I mean, I've had, uh, oh God, I've had the most remarkable experiences with people who may misunderstand me. And then, you know, I, 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 I learned something about them or I learned something about a side of myself that I never would have expected. So anyway, yeah, I would recommend to anybody just just throw open the doors, you know, be transparent that's, because it can bring you things that you wouldn't expect. That's so funny. I had written down to uh, to ask you how important transparency is as someone that's, you know, voicing or orating these ideas. I, I think it's very important because when I'm speaking to people, particularly about the material in the Miracle Club, for example, in that book, I'm representing benefits that have accrued to me and that have accrued to other people from using these metaphysical methods. Yeah, it's personal. And I've, it's personal. And I, it would be the height of hypocrisy for me to not be blunt with people, including 
to not be blunt about my failures. You know, I, I, I want people to know that I've had great successes, I've had failures, and I've, I've let people down in my life. You know, I, I don't ever want to paint a picture that distances me from, you know, whomever happens to be reading my book at a given moment, because he and I are leading the same life. And, and if I can be explicit with that person, it can give him sucker and hope and ideas and practical things to try that I'm offering to him in a spirit of transparency. So I, I am, I do write fairly intimately with people in the new book. Um, I write about my hospitalization at age 12 for anxiety, for example. I, mm-hmm. I never knew years ago whether I would find the gumption to write about that, but I feel it's very important to share that with people because I want them to know that I'm dealing with and I'm offering them as best as I possibly can real world ideas. And if I, if I play some game of theatricality with people, then I'm not really representing to them. I'm not really being frank and, and blunt and direct with them. And I feel that's owed to the reader. Yeah, I mean, my own story, my own narrative is a bit of a redemption arc. I utilize magical means and metaphysical methods to dig myself out of a horrible trajectory that I was immersed in for a while. And yet I find that's probably the most relatable anchor to tell people, hey, this is why I'm into this. This is why uh, I put so much thought and power into this. But it's still like a cumbersome idea to kind of regale the uh, trauma or the the troubles that came before it, you know? Yes, yes. Um, I also feel, and I, I, I write about this in the book, and I feel very strongly about it, that metaphysical writers, because they're addressing intimate issues of daily life, because they're suggesting to people alternative paths to take, paths that can be very impactful on one's relationships and career and so on, they have a special obligation to be accurate uh, as best as possible. They have a special obligation to be transparent. And I have seen cases in New Age publishing where people tell stories and, you know, they claim to be changing names or locales to protect the privacy of the subjects involved. But very often they're doing those things to cover their own tracks, to make themselves, uh, less subject to fact checking, yeah. frankly. And I've seen cases where I've been terribly disappointed where metaphysical writers have either created composite characters, um, combining the circumstances from different people's lives uh, dramatically into one character. And they'll claim that they're doing it for reasons of uh, ease of storytelling. But the truth is what they're really doing is they're creating a fictional device because if you if you take the traits of two different people and you combine them into one character, you're falsely, falsely creating a sense of heightened right. dr- drama. And it's, it's misleading you know, to the reader. I also have worked with writers who have altered timelines so that their redemption story seems more, has a more dramatic pitch, a more wow. dramatic arc. You know, for example, if they're writing about addiction, uh, they omit episodes of recidivism. Yep. And the truth is everybody who struggled with an addiction knows, everybody knows that you suffer periods of recidivism. Yeah. I mean, there's hardly an exception to that. So to not write about that gives the idea that, oh, I saw the burning bush and then everything was just fine. And it's like, well, everything's not fine after you see the burning bush. You might see the burning bush <laughs> and go through periods of great recidivism. And by the way, after Moses saw the burning bush, it's not like his life was one clear beeline of events. Right. He suffered. Right. He argued with God. He went through terrible suffering. He struggled with anger. So I feel it's deeply important when you're writing about intimate material uh, that you're asking people to experiment with in their own lives, that you be very blunt and very clear about the consequences of this material in your life, good and bad. Yeah. I'd love to get into the Miracle Club for a bit. It uh, it really resonated with me as someone who kind of grew up within the new thought or the beginning of the new age movement, I should say, with uh, Marilyn Ferguson and... Yes, yes. Um, 
That's the, you know, where the name of this podcast actually comes from is from her brain mind bulletin. I didn't know that. Yeah. How wonderful. How but, wonderful. Um, so it's always resonated. It's always been deeply ingrained in me. And it had largely uh, been a sore subject, I think, yes. for the past decade or so, because, and I think specifically of the book, The Secret and its legacy. Yes. And I was wondering yes. if you could maybe explain where New Thought was before you've decided to reform it in a way. Well, that's a fascinating question. You know, it's funny, before The Secret, in a way, things were very sleepy in New Thought. You yeah. know, the, the, the major books had been written, the methods of New Thought had been thoroughly incorporated into the mainstream. One didn't hear the term very much. And when Rhonda Byrne published The, the Secret and, and released the movie, I remember at first, and this is funny, but it's typical of human nature, there was resentment within New Thought circles at the sudden success that Rhonda was experiencing because people tended to roll their eyes and say, how is this the secret? It's been around for 150 years or right. some, some odd number. And people first wanted to kind of almost roll their eyes at it within the subculture and act like this was just some sort of a knockoff of what we have already known about. But Rhonda's great gift, and I think something for people to be very mindful of, is that she didn't live uh, in L.A. or New York City or San Francisco where she had a bunch of people whispering in her ear, gee, you know, this is already old hat. This isn't the secret. This has been out there for decades, yeah, more than decades. And instead, you know, she lived in Australia and maybe didn't have that kind of bi-coastal chatterbox running in her head. And as it turned out, and this was so remarkable, for most people in the Western world, this was still a secret in the sense that they hadn't heard of it. This was completely new to them. It's a large world we live in. Yeah. And sometimes we think, you know, something is out there, something is obvious, but it's not obvious to the great majority of people. It's a very big world. And the book answered a call. The movie answered a call and answered a need. And I, I, I've written critically of Rhonda because I have deep differences with her personally. Right. My philosophy differs from her philosophy. I don't believe, as she does, in one overarching law of attraction or mental super law. I think that's a mistake. We live under many, many laws and forces. And I have deep differences with Rhonda, which I've written about in my book, One Simple Idea, which is a history of the positive mind movement. Right. At the same time, I've come to admire her and her accomplishments more and more over the years because she did open millions of people up to the idea that you can use your mind in a different way. It is possible to use your mind in a different way. And I think that she gave a tremendous gift to people in opening them up to that possibility. I've also, and I've written about this uh, recently, I've grown very weary of the backlash against the secret. I, yeah. I get tired of people using it as a punching bag because, first of all, most of the people who criticize it haven't seen or read it. And I could tell immediately. I mean, the same way that a seventh grade English teacher can tell which kid hasn't read Lord of the Flies, I can always instantly tell who hasn't read or watched the secret, who hasn't read Think and Grow Rich, you know, I could tell in an instant. Yeah. And of course, <clears throat> the vast majority of people who talk it down have never approached it. And I decided a couple of years ago to rewatch the movie with one of my kids. And I discovered that I liked the values in it. And, and it, it doesn't make some of the extremist claims that some of the critics claim that it does. And they make these claims, again, just because of an experience. They haven't seen it. And I think it was a positive phenomenon on, on the scene. I really, really do. And I think it opened people to a whole range of possibilities. It also provided a very convenient punching bag for critics. <laughs> yeah. But that punching bag is always available. You know, before The Secret, there was Norman Vincent Peale's The Power of Positive Thinking. And, totally. you know, before that, there was Think and Grow Rich. So th there's always going to be some... There's always going to be some... Uh, sensationally titled book that or movie that 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 people focus in on to complain about the excesses of the new age culture i mean this has yeah. literally been going on since h.l mankin 
literally. And um, it, it follows a certain template. And that's one of the things I try to address in my book. You know, the, the, the critics are not well-rounded in most cases. Some of them are. Some yeah. of them are. And but very, very few, very, very few. They're just not well-rounded. They're <laughs> well, functioning, you know, they're arguing with their objection to an idea rather than addressing the specifics of a given work. Right, and I think that's that's the beauty um, that you've expressed in the Miracle Club, that there is essentially a good essence to most kind of spirituality or most, uh, you know, methods of spiritual expression. But this also seems a bit part and parcel to the academic occult reception of the Kabbalion, which you've yes. kind of flipped recently, too. I read that you had felt the same uh, disinterest in it until recently, yes. and then it flipped. So what flipped for, with the Kabbalion for you? Oh, I appreciate you bringing that up. It was so interesting. For years and years and years, I had regarded the Kabbalion as this novelty of early 20th century occultism. Right. I regarded it as new thought sort of dressed up in Cleopatra garb. Uh -huh. I didn't take it all that seriously. And, you know, it was interesting. Another religious scholar, another mainstream guy who wouldn't want his name associated with such tawdry material, was <laughs> speaking with me once about the Kabbalion. And with a little gleam in his eye, he said to me, you know, there are some very interesting ideas in that little book. And that, among other things, got me thinking anew about the Kabbalion. And in the summer of 2017, I returned to it, and I read it uh, five times consecutively. And what I discovered was that, in fact, not only are there some good ideas in that little book, but there are some epic ideas, some truly epic ideas that comport well with classical hermeticism. And I came into a whole newfound respect for the book. And it's funny. I gave an address uh, last spring at Rice University where I spoke about the Kabbalion, among other things, and I'm, uh, I have a paper coming out from the academic publisher Brill where I talk about the authentic hermetic retentions, albeit indirect retentions, right. that appear in the work of Edgar Cayce, Neville Goddard, and the Kabbalion. So it might be the first time, or one of the first times, that the Kabbalion is written about in a mainstream scholarly context. And that gives me a lot of joy because I think that that book has never received its complete due. It certainly was an underground uh, sensation for many, many, many decades. But I was wrong, you know, in my view of the Kabbalion. I, I, I underestimated it. And I, I, I was filled with this feeling of joy in the summer of 2017 that I came to this new view on it that helped me see the book's worth more fully but also helped me use the book more fully. I just gave a talk the other night on Hermeticism and the Kabbalion at Masonic Hall here in New York City. And I was very touched by how many people in the crowd responded to ideas in the book, had their own particular take on ideas in the book. And I felt like we were all kind of functioning as a group, rediscovering this book together. Yeah. And the power of the group is so important and so necessary today. And um, that was my rediscovery of it. I'm now making a documentary film about the Kabbalion, I was gonna ask which is you. directed. Yeah, my friend Ronnie Thomas, who's a brilliant director, is directing it and 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 writing it with me, and it, it's going to be extraordinary. He and I are going to Egypt on January 30th to do research, and we're going to be there for about a week, and it's going to be very exciting. And Ronnie's visuals are just extraordinary. He's a true auteur, and He's going to bring a whole new standard, I think, yeah. of filmmaking and artistry to an occult subject in the contemporary era. So I'm very excited about it. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, I it had always been in my periphery, but because of, I don't know, maybe like academic occult, not elitism, but kind of, you know, uh, stoicism in a way. Yes. Uh, yes. Has, yes. You know, it kind of kept me from from reading it. And when I finally read it, I was like, what's the big what's the big deal? You know, what's why, right, why are right. people so up in the arms? And my good academic friends or academic occultist friends, I think are just more peeved. And this is similar to the secret that um, it's packaged in a way that may come off as disingenuous or yeah, the, the yeah. origins of it aren't uh, 
rightly giving reference to the corpus hermeticum or or whatever yeah it may be and does it matter if there's uh, an original source and its reference is is the is the original source better that's a wonderful question uh and there's a couple of things to unpack there you know a friend of mine richard smoley pointed out that it's funny it's ironic that people get put off by the drama that surrounds the Kabbalion and by the 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 drama of the uh, uh, byline three initiates, you know, the anonymity right. and the kind of occult pageantry and theater that's brought to the book. But he points out correctly that the, the original hermetic literature was signed by Hermes Trismegistus, you know, who right. was not a guy hanging around Alexandria, you know, in the decades following Christ, you know, I mean, people, yeah. there was always a pageantry to it's said to be Thoth hermeticism. Even. Say again. It's said to be Thoth or, you know, right. Exactly. Exactly. So there's always been a pageantry of a sort around the hermetic literature. So in, in that sense, the Kabbalion is, is, is walking in imperfect step with hermetic tradition. What could be more hermetic than a mysterious byline? You know? So in that sense, it's 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 a perfect reflection of of classical hermeticism, and how important is it to harken back to the source? I always believe that the seeker should know his or her roots. It enriches experience, and in that sense, I think the Kabbalist should have some sort of a working knowledge of of Hebrew. Uh, the astrologer should have some working knowledge of the astronomical phenomena behind that which he or she is is reading. The tarot reader should know something about the gestation and the history of the real history of tarot cards, which certain very good historians, including Robert Place, have written about. And I I do believe that you can read the Kabbalion and you can profit from it in and of itself, but I encourage it as a gateway to reading good translations of the Hermetic literature as well, because You'll see connections. You might see things that the author left out. You might see things that enrich your search. I think being well-rounded is very important, and, and it, it will enrich your experience of the Kabbalion. And yeah, that, that totally makes sense. And that kind of brings me to what I was going to ask about New Thought in general. And that was, you had mentioned that New Thought values and methods should shine away from or shine the way for each seeker, whatever his values or circumstances, to shape his life and the world in accordance to his higher self. And yes. I was wondering if, because you talk a little bit about it, but the kind of dark side of that, or maybe this harkens back to what we were talking about, the lineage of how the uh, secret was perceived, the material. Yes. Thing. But I can kind yes. of see, you know, this run amok within Trump. You know, or yes, or yes, people yes. that yeah. So how how important is it that uh, there be a kind of moral structure when it comes to this? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. There's so much to unpack there. We can't hide from the dark side. You know, I mean, yeah. we can't say, well, gee, look, all of this results in Trump, and isn't that terrible? You know, because um, everything everything that's available to us in life presents us with a dual, a, a, a multiplicity of paths. You know, people always feel that magic or new thought or mind metaphysics opens the door on some dark possibilities. But isn't that true of everything? You know, I mean, that's true of recreational drugs. That's true of, you know, you might have one guy who's capable of smoking cannabis, and for him it's just a a relaxant, and it's good for a, another guy. It becomes an addiction, you know. Uh, and this is true of so much, you know. I mean, some people come into money and they they use it to be provident and productive and intelligent, and other people just blow it on nonsense, you know. And then they're more unhappy than they were before, you know. So everything, every means that life presents us, everything has a multiplicity of paths. Now, Trump is somebody who has dedicated his entire life to the amoral pursuit of power. He's a, a hugely negative person, a hugely unhappy person, because happy people are not up at seven in the morning insulting people on Twitter. <laughs> and, you know, he's this wretchedly unhappy guy, an inveterate liar. And 
And yet he does use these methods effectively. He has this incredible capacity to create his own weather system, so to speak. Yeah. He's also an incredible communicator. I mean, people underestimate the depth of his capacity to steer a conversation. I saw him being interviewed by the journalist Leslie Stahl uh, several weeks ago on 60 Minutes. And he was capable of responding to her questions very effectively without it turning into this brawl. You know, and he, he reads people very quickly. He's a brilliant man in, in some regards. I, I think he's a horrible and insipidly foolish man in other regards. But yeah. anybody who has their doubts about whether um, the power of positive thinking is actually workable uh, need only look at him. You know, yeah. he grew up with that book. It may be the only book he's ever read. You know, uh, he's the, the only time I've ever heard him speak pensively about anything uh, has been his childhood memories of sitting, listening to the sermons of the Reverend Norman Vincent Peale, who wrote Power of Positive Thinking. It's the only side of Trump that I find remotely relatable. Um, and and so when you combine this absolute lack of ethics, of empathy, of personal grounding, of dedication to any higher ideal with mind metaphysics, you get Donald Trump. When you combine it with a wish, I think, to be expressive and creative and provident, uh, you get something else. Yeah. But this is true of every area of life. I mean, you, you know, you can you can provide a, a person with a scalpel, and that scalpel can become an instrument of healing, or it can become a weapon, depending on the individual, or it can become any number of things in between. So there's no unique burden uh, on new thought. Uh, in this regard, this is just one of the situations of life. But uh, Trump is so certainly the poster boy for how powerful this uh, stuff can be. And he has unfortunately run amok with it. So now the question to the individual is, well, what are you going to do about it? You know, um, my friend Miguel Connor has a wonderful expression, which is magic works whether you believe it or not. So you don't have to believe it. But <laughs> You better figure out whether you want to use all the tools in your tool chest. See, I, I was a practicing chaos magician for a long time, and and still oh, cool. am to a degree. Um, yeah. Even though I believe it should be a non-dogmatic thing, so describing it, I agree, is not is not conducive to what I think it should be. But one of the things right, is right. belief as a tool, and there's it just marries a lot with new thought, and yes. Um, I was wondering one of the phrases that a lot of like chaos magicians will will throw out there is fake it till you make it. And yeah, I yeah. wonder how potent or powerful you find that phrase. I am working with it. I am working with it. You know, that, that phrase actually has its earliest roots in the recovery movement. It was probably in Alcoholics Anonymous that that phrase was first used. And um, I am working with it. I am interested in that idea. Yeah. And I, I know there's truth to it. I, I know there's truth to it. And I appreciate what you said about the importance of dispensing with any kind of dogma and chaos magic, because what could be more ironic than this anarchistic form of magic that we suddenly start drawing up rules around, you know, exactly. it's absurd. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's important to retain that sense of irony and, and sense of humor about all this. You know, the, um, um, the brilliant thinker, Michael Aquino, who has written brilliantly on, on the satanic, he made the observation that organizations uh, organized around Satanism are usually very small or usually wither away. And that's a sign of success because as soon as you're getting places in your search on the left-hand path, everybody wants to be in charge. Right. Everybody wants to be their own person. Everybody's an anarchist, you know? And so yeah. no one wants to be in some organization setting up chairs. You know, they want to be out there in the world and they want to be the one in charge, you know? So of course the organization has to wither away, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so totally. nobody gets along, you know? Everybody has his own way of doing things. Um, so I, I agree with fake it till you make it. And, um, uh, I, I, uh, but I can't say anything conclusive about it because I'm experimenting with it. But, you know, one of the wonderful things about these experiments is you can issue a challenge to your listeners that, 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 that goes as follows, you know, and this is just one of many different variations. Fake it till you make it for a single hour. You know, yeah. you don't have to embrace this as a life philosophy at 3 PM today, wherever you find yourself at work or having lunch or shopping or whatever, dedicate 60 minutes of your life to living from the end, 
to living from as much as you possibly can from the feeling state and with the physical comportment that you've attained exactly what you want in life. See what happens. Something out of the ordinary may occur. Give it one hour of your life and just see what occurs. That's the kind of challenge I like because there's a possibility that somebody will actually do it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I'm definitely going to say that right now. Whoever's listening, please attempt this and write me. (laughs) One one hour. That's all. One hour. Just give us one hour. Um, and have yeah. you have you ever heard of the? This reminded me of the ikigai, the uh, Japanese no. phrase. No, I haven't. It's a Japanese phrase. It's kind of making the rounds in corporate America because they're so elevated with their sense of business. And ikigai means reason for being, and it's a oh. confluence of what you're good at, what you're passionate about, what you can get paid for, and what the world needs. That's fascinating. Yeah. How wonderful. And I was wondering How yeah, wonderful. if you had, have, had heard that phrase, because I think for someone like me that has a barrage of, of different passions that stems from that definite chief aim, such as yourself, is yeah. it, how does one discern which avenue to take? That, that, yeah. That's not too elusive of a question. No, not at all. I, I appreciate hearing that Japanese term. I mean, the term that I often here is dharma of course you right. know from the vedic tradition and that seems to have something to do with dharma but but there's a shade of difference in that you're asking specifically what's the world need that's not necessarily absent from dharma but that's a very interesting uh emphasis yeah. and you know i asked that question once of david lynch and he said to me look you know you start seeing where you're getting the green lights, you know, where are the green lights coming from? Because he started out with the intention of being a painter and he saw film as a kind of visual painting. And so he pursued film in that regard as a student and he found that it was successful for him. He was, he was getting ideas across. He was enjoying what he was doing. He was reaching people. Yeah. So I think there's a, a kind of trial and error, you know, uh, quality to all this where, you're you're trying to express your dharma you're trying to live out your passions you're trying to get across what you wish for in the world and where are the green lights you know where are resources coming from where where are you receiving joy from where are you finding a constituency i think there's a a kind of necessary uh trial and error in all that talking about new thought and finding this you know passion i think passion can be a loaded word too that might there needs to be something more specific because I think yes, I was consumed by passions when I was in my you know desert days, as I call them, and it, it was almost antithetical to what they should elicit, you know, because you can be like eaten by them if unfocused yes. or yeah, mainly it just goes back to this interpersonal ethics too. Yes, about it. Yes, yes. I mean, passion needs to have a practical outlet, and it also needs to conform in in some way or another to one's capacities in the world. You know, otherwise it just becomes an idle daydream of sorts. You know, there when when you feel a passion, um, there must be something actionable about it. There there must be some step you can take, however small, in the direction of of your wish or in the direction of what you want to be doing. Uh, If that's absent, if that small concrete step is absent, then you have to ask yourself whether this is just self-entertainment because we can get very caught up with dramas in our head. And even if they're ultimately unsatisfying, they can be satisfying on a certain level because they're kind of an internal piece of theater and they can feel very exciting and they can feel very temporarily satisfying in the moment such as thinking about having a love affair that may never be possible. But if it's never possible, then, you know, it it really just becomes, it can become almost an addiction, like a psychological addiction, really. Totally. Uh, And you're getting a rush from it, but it's not proceeding anywhere. and, And it's a compulsion rather than a satisfaction. So I think one has to look at that very carefully. Passions have to be moored to some step that one can take in the actual yeah i mean uh yeah that was that perfectly encapsulates i think what my resolve was at the end of all that all that madness you know 
but I was wondering as someone who, you know, you had mentioned in the Miracle Club too, that like your, the passion or, or the definite chief aim, or I'm, I forget the, the term you, you called it, but the yeah. uh, focus, you know, it needs yeah. to be, it can't be antithetical uh, to your other things in life. Like say, yes. you know, me, uh, you know, I, I, my, my focus is to be this traveling musician, you know, uh, this kind of vagabond person that also wants to start a family and that won't, it's like inherently antithetical. To yes. Each other. Yes. So I was yes. wondering you as a father, as an orator, as a writer, as, you know, a publisher, how, what is the formula that you kind of created for yourself? I think you had said once that uh, life gives you a formula. Yes, life does give you a formula and it's a, it's a tough formula, but it can be potentially hugely rewarding. And it is that we usually receive or receive something very close to one thing that we want with our absolute heart, one thing that we're willing to sacrifice everything for, one thing that is as important to us as physical sustenance itself. And once you arrive at that one thing, whatever it may be, you've discovered something profoundly important and you mustn't make compromises that contradict your one thing. That doesn't mean that you don't have obligations to other people. It doesn't mean you don't have obligations to your health, to your family and so on and so forth. But usually most of the figures you admire in life, whoever they may be, whether they're activists or entrepreneurs or artists or generals, Usually they have one absolute thing that they lived for and that was as important to them as drawing breath. And it's a tough, tough bargain that life strikes with us. But I do believe that's the closest thing to a kind of magic formula that we're given. Yeah. And it behooves the individual to sit down and ask him or herself, what is this one thing I want with everything in me, with everything in me? And it can be tough because we don't like to see ourselves as selfish. We don't like to see ourselves as single-minded. We don't like to see ourselves as uh, pursuant of something uh, maybe contrary to other goals that we may have. But I do believe that it's, it's an extraordinary act of focus and a summoning of everything within and without us that can come to our aid to have that one absolute focus. It shouldn't be trifled with. It should not be trifled with. It's yeah. enormously powerful. Yeah. Do you think uh, sacrifice is kind of part and parcel to um, attaining this in life? You know, yes. like in magic, whether it's literal or ethereal or metaphorical, there's something that you kind of give up to get in a way. Yes. Yes, I, I do. I mean, once once you've decided, for example, that... Um, I don't, you know, people have such diffuse and different aims, but once you've decided that something is your absolute aim, it, it commands your time, it commands your relationships, it commands your resources. And there are naturally going to be other things that fall away and that become distantly secondary, which is also why it's important to have an aim that covers a lot of different bases. Right. I mean, you might have an aim that takes you out of your home a lot, for example, but at the same time, Maybe that aim will be very remunerative and you'll be able to provide resources in ways that um, don't necessarily compensate for your being away from home, but that are, are, are at least a complement to, to that. You know, you can be yeah. providing to other people. So, you know, you're not just operating from this go it alone perspective. Uh, it's important, I believe, to have an aim, if possible, that, that covers a lot of different bases in life, since naturally we're all compelled to wear different hats. But one must be brutally honest with oneself. If you're choosing to be um, a stand-up comic, you know, just to choose a random example, you're going to be working five nights a week, you know, ideally. Yeah. And you know, you're gonna you're gonna miss holidays and you're gonna miss dinners and you're gonna you may miss a birthday here and there. You know, you're not going to be yeah. the ideal uh, domestic organizer um, because you're going to be away and. You know, don't try to hide from that. Don't try to hide from that. But the question is, you know, hand in glove with that, does that mean you have uh, other things, you know, that, that you can provide that en enrich the lives of people around you? Right. 
but don't 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 kid yourself. I mean, heaven heaven forbid you should kid yourself because once you choose a definite chief aim and you really feel it with a, an absolute passionate dedication and obsession, things will happen. And 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 your time and resources and relationships will also be directed uh, in the uh, uh, toward the flow of that aim. You had mentioned in the Miracle Club, and this is good for anyone listening who's kind of a nascent seeker of any sort. And I think you wrote an article too on a medium about what gurus to look out for. Yes, and sketchy I, gurus. Yeah, yeah, sketchy gurus. I love that. If there was a limit of woo in all of your experience that resoundingly says that this method or this idea is not honest or false. Yeah. Well, uh, be very suspicious of people who present themselves as the man with the plan, because there's a kind of theater that gurus and ministers and psychologists and others get into where, you know, inevitably you go to see them at some fixed time, at some fixed appointment. Right. And, you know, you sit down in an office or in a room or in a study or at a restaurant or something, and they're supposed to be the ones who are disclosing the truth to you or helping to guide you. And either implicitly or explicitly, they are aware of their role. And they sort of maintain that role almost as, a, as an actor plays a part. And they enjoy that role. Uh, they enjoy the idea that you as the seeker or the patient or the client have to come and see them. And they enjoy either implicitly or explicitly possessing a certain mantle of authority. And in the vast majority of cases, they are every bit as uncertain and unsteady, if not more so, than the person seated across the table from them. And I know this for a fact because I've been in that situation where I'm supposed to be the man with the plan and somebody comes to me and, you know, they're looking to me earnestly as if I have some answers and shame on me if I play that make-believe role of guru or something. Most people don't deserve that title. I don't like words like guru. I don't like words like enlightened. I don't like any of those terms Mm -hmm. because I've seen Mm -hmm. behind the curtain and, and, and in innumerable cases, the person who presents him or herself as the authority whether in a religious setting or therapeutic setting, very frequently falls apart at the first instance of stress in his or her life and has no greater resources internally than the person coming to see them. And so I'm very suspicious of any kind of relationship where somebody presents him or herself as the authority figure. Uh And... I think it was Ralph Waldo Emerson pointed out somewhere, and this kind of validated a belief I had already come to myself, that if you were to take the most brilliant people on earth, inventors, diplomats, scientists, you name it, you'd probably find that they're right only maybe one out of every five times. And nobody ever talks about their failures. Nobody ever talks about their lack of insight. Nobody ever talks about just instances where they got it wrong. I always used to warn people in publishing Brilliant people are uh, very often wrong. Brilliant people are very often wrong. And that was the same basic point that Emerson was making. So how much more so one has to be guided by that principle when you're approaching some so-called guru or something, especially in a top-down organization. And I'm not saying don't get involved with a guru. I'm not saying don't get involved with a teacher. I mean, you may. And it may provide you with some of the most wonderful experiences of your life. And I'll be the first one in line to shake your hand and say, that's great. You know, mm-hmm. but just be very, very careful about the theatricality that's present when somebody presents him or herself as a guru. Same is true of secret societies. I mean, it's nonsense in the vast majority of cases. As soon as somebody asks me, like, what order do I belong to or what secret society do I belong to? Uh the answer, first of all, is none. And, right. and yet, you know, it, immediately my interest in talking to that person precipitously declines because that's just a kind of um, seeking a badge or seeking a flag to stand under. I'm much more interested, for example, in what you were saying about 
this principle and chaos magic of fake it till you make it. I mean, this is something we can all do yeah. for an hour and, you know, see what happens. And then we'll compare notes and, you know, it, it creates a, an authentic exchange, you know, rather than some guru uh, giving directions. And I'm not saying I'm opposed to the guru model, but I'm saying these are areas where a person just has to approach warily. With the Miracle Club, I feel, and I've written about this too, that I largely feel it's a reboot almost or a revamp of new thought. And it covers things that deeply resonated with me, especially the mental health and uh, the tragedy aspects, things that were, yes. that were unanswered and weren't uh, really developed at all from prior texts. Now with you yes. answering those things to a, a great degree, I must admit too, as, as nebulous as those ideas can be, I think you tackled them like beautifully. I wonder you. what your idea of the trajectory of new thought or this mind metaphysics is looking like now. I appreciate that question. You know, it's interesting. I've kind of come to a point of view on that over the past several days. The methods that exist in new thought are sound. The developments that are occurring in science, placebo studies, psychical research, quantum theory, they are conf they are confirming certain instincts that the new thought pioneers had and this is all good the new direction that i believe new thought needs is just to have a culture of greater intellectual seriousness we need to be more mature it's only through maturity that we'll expand the conversation with one another that we'll be able to adequately uh, explore the contradictions and the problems that exist within new thought. You know, the typical example is, you know, in some cases, uh, something, some set of steps seem to work beautifully and we're delivered to exactly what we want. Mm -hmm. And then we repeat the very same set of steps and nothing happens. And, and it leaves the, the seeker with a terrible and urgent question. And Without a mature intellectual culture with a new thought, it's impossible to explore that question. We can only deepen our search through, I think, having a more grown-up approach. I mean, new thought, like every other movement, is plagued by dogma and catechism. And as right. soon as somebody comes along who starts questioning the articles of faith, out comes the fundamentalism. And believe me, I don't need to tell you, it is as common in new thought as it is anywhere else. It's a, It's a problem of human nature. Yeah. That as soon as you say something that challenges some opinion or point of view or experience upon which somebody has settled, they're hostile. They're hostile. And that's a symptom of a, a, a lack of, I think, intellectual development, dedication to the search, and the harboring of a question. When you're not able to harbor a question, everything becomes fundamentalism in a certain sense, including our, our various New Age and Eastern or magical philosophies. So I don't think New Thought as a culture has been sufficiently capable of harboring the question. I think that by and large, its speakers, its churches, its congregations, its magazines uh, often have a kind of childish tone. And, yeah. and that's a shame because the ideas are sound and the ideas are magical and the ideas are epic. But we won't get as far as we could get if we don't have a greater culture of questioning, you know, and I, I, I want that to be very expansive. And I want to know why does something work one time and then not work another? And, and I'm not interested in an answer based on catechism. I'm not interested in somebody telling me, well, the individual did it wrong. Well, what if the individual didn't do it wrong? Maybe our whole philosophy is wrong. You know, maybe, maybe we're the ones who are wrong. You know, it's like, we, we can't be afraid to go anywhere. And, and that spirit of experimentation uh, is, I think, the future of new thought. That's, that's where we need to be. How important is it to you to hit this uh, new new thought? I, um, I'm not sure what to call it in regards to that. Yeah, but is I don't to, know what to call it either. <laughs> to reach across the aisle, because one of the greatest things about, I think, new thought, or one of the things that it did really well was that it gave big ideas to middle America or to, yes. you know, smaller, uh, lower classes. And I think that is definitely missing these days from all the highfalutin kind of uh, 
stoic academic occultists and and those ideas totally so i wonder what, i agree so that agree. was an, an intention of the miracle club yes definitely a spiritual or ethical philosophy has to be demonstrated in results it has to demonstrate some improvement in the conduct and life of the individual and i think that our spiritual culture has been in in certain uh, quarters has been plagued by this kind of airsats seriousness. Uh, I know of new age centers that don't want to host channelers or astrologers or tower readers because they regard that material as gauche or unseriousness right. or unserious. Nothing could be more foolish. Nothing could be more foolish because they're closing the door on the possibility that the freshest, most important voice could come from any number of those reaches. Uh, but they have this blanket policy that suggests that, well, those are poisoned waters. Nothing good can come from, from that. And it's the, it's the epitome of generalized thinking. It will get you nowhere. There are likewise certain journals that don't want to participate in topics that uh, reek of occultism which is a huge mistake because again, we have all kinds of doorways into ideas and the, the, the job of the seeker, the job of the publisher, the job of the gatekeeper, the job of the curator is not to decide which ideas are valid or not, but to decide which people, <clears throat> which artists, which writers have fresh and compelling voices. And then you let those people wander into whatever forests and meadows they want to wander into. I mean, imagine telling Carl Jung or D.H. Lawrence or Henry Miller that you shouldn't be dabbling in astrology. That's not <laughs> serious. You know, I mean, yeah. you, you, you find the artist, you find the seeker, and then you let him or her go into whatever darkened wood they want. That's, that's funny you mentioned Henry Miller, because in your book, you talk about, you know, choosing one book and living that that book and its philosophies for uh, like a month. Yes. And my yeah. my first one was Stand Still Like the Hummingbird from Henry Miller. Oh, how interesting. And yeah, it's just that's funny you brought that up. So we, and we'll wrap up. Um, I know you're got to be a busy man, <laughs> but I want to <laughs> thank you so much uh, for spending thank you. This time, I just have Pleasure. two quick questions, One, yep. both kind of selfish. Uh, the first one is, what is the deal with rock and roll and the occult? The second one is, what would be your advice for someone that shares a similar definite chief aim that really uh, helped uh, progress your definite chief aim? Absolutely. Uh, well, the rock and roll question is a huge question. I mean, right. boy, that is a really epic question. I know I shouldn't say that the last. <laughs> I know it's okay. Your listeners will have to forgive me for, you know, I can only give sort of one, one or two tantalizing suggestions. Uh, it seems to me rock and roll is so deeply, deeply rooted in, in the African American experience, including in the experience of people who were were brought here in a horrific system of slavery that lasted for centuries. Yeah. And, and I think that in seeking to find expressions that were affirming of life, um, enslaved people arrived at musical ideas, at ideas of, of emancipation, at uh, spiritual ideas, some of which I think probably were authentic retentions of certain traditional uh, religious ideas from West and Central Africa, and which we would call a cult, uh, since they were transplanted to a system here in America that made no space for them. They were implicitly, they were intrinsically, they were necessarily outsider ideas. Right. Some of the ideas from ancient Africa, some of the musical styles uh, that were developed to try to affirm life in horrible conditions. I think there's DNA strands within rock and roll of all that. So rock and what we would call the occult, which is to say outsider religious ideas, were infused from the very beginning and spring from the, the African diaspora experience. I think that's one reason why the occult and rock and roll 
have always had something to do with one another. And this goes right up to Johnny Rotten singing, I am the Antichrist, you know, yeah. this is powerful stuff, you know, and I think that you can find the, the DNA for that within the African diaspora experience. And the second question, as far as any counsel I could give somebody who has a, a similar definite chief aim as my own, I would say, start, start writing, start speaking. It's very important that an idea have a constituency. It's very important that you place yourself in front of an audience, no matter how small at first. The thing I always used to look for when people sent me a book proposal was whether they had road tested their ideas out in front of some kind of an audience, including just writing for their local, you know, new age newsletter or, or free giveaway magazine or something, you know, but any, any kind of demonstration that somebody hasn't just been a solitary thinker, just, you know, kind of sitting in their apartment, but has been out there in the world testing their ideas in front of some kind of audience of whatever size, that's golden. That is absolutely golden. So artists require constituencies. So go out there and find your constituency. Uh, start. Begin. That's absolutely reaffirming. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, a pleasure. Is there anything you want to mention before you leave? Sure. Um, I have all kinds of speaking gigs coming up. The easiest way to keep track is to <clears throat> follow me on Twitter or Facebook. I'm on Twitter at Mitch Horowitz. My website is MitchHorowitz.com. And there's all kinds of links to different goodies and things there. I do, I've done a lot of recent writing for the Washington Post and in Medium. If people want to kind of keep track of what I'm up to at this given moment, they could visit those places. And um, people can always write to me through my website. I, I, I try to respond to everyone. So, uh, And I appreciate this interview. I thought your questions were just great. They, they brought a lot out of me. Thank you. You are literally a gentleman and a scholar. <laughs> I really appreciate your time. Pleasure. I hope this is just the first of many. For sure. I'd be delighted to come back. Thanks, Mitch. I appreciate it. All right, man. Take care. An intellectual and metaphysical come up indeed. How awesome. How brutally synchronous is it that I get to sandwich or bookend this transformative metaphysical uh, ritual I did under that 2017 eclipse while I was reading Mitch to talk with him under this new one as I finalize and I guess progress this beautiful quote unquote definite chief aim, this ikigai if you will. If you'd like to support the show, please consider either donating through PayPal, which is listed in the show notes below, or becoming a patron to our metaphysical art collective, We The Hallowed, at patreon.com slash we the hallowed. And for a dollar a month, you can get extras such as full unedited episodes like our conversation with Elizabeth Kenimer. She was in episode 13 and she'll be the guest at this weekend's first We The Hallowed Salon where she'll be sharing some initiatory meditation practices from her cult therapy. So that's really exciting. Anyways, as always, much love, so much gratitude. I couldn't be happier. Love you all. Haunt on.